The single worst day of my life started in the unlikeliest of ways, when I took a trip to visit my grandpa near Omaha, Nebraska. The first problem I ran into was the lack of cell signal out there in the sticks. No internet meant my GPS started going haywire, and I'd never been great at reading physical maps. That, and there were basically no road signs anywhere. The ones that were there were in such bad shape you could barely read them, even if you slowed down heavily when passing by. In the end, I had to actually stop by some random guy's house to ask for directions. The fact that even he didn't seem to know what I was talking about didn't really fill me with much confidence. He did mention of knowing of an old house off a dirt road, maybe a mile or two away from his own. He said it wouldn't be the easiest to find, but he was basically 75% sure it was close to the area I was talking about. I went off and headed in the direction he'd pointed out, hoping to make it to my grandpa's before lunchtime. A few minutes later, I spotted a dirt road turnoff that I thought might be the one the man had been talking about. After driving down it for a few minutes though, I didn't see any houses or any kind of civilization. I figured I must have made a wrong turn. Not surprising, considering how crappy the infrastructure was, but it was pretty frustrating. Then, luckily, I saw a driveway out of nowhere. I started to get my hopes up, thinking this must be my grandpa's place. It clearly wasn't though. There were a bunch of men with a van and a car, all stood around talking. My grandpa wasn't exactly one for company but I figured at least I could ask them for some more directions. That's exactly what I went to do, but the second I turned into their driveway, I noticed the men standing around started to act a little anxious. One guy immediately tore away from the circle they had going. Another looked around, as though he was expecting other people to show up or something. I realized I must have just interrupted something very private. I didn't fully realize the danger I'd just driven into though. Right as I stopped the car, I heard one of the guys yell something to another. Then I took my eyes off them for a second as I reached for the road map I had. When I looked up again, all I could see was a gun pointing at me through my driver's side window. I realized now in the few seconds that followed and I was just waiting for the guy to pull the trigger. I can't remember anything other than gun, but I didn't move. I just froze there, didn't try to back out or duck or anything. I just sort of waited for everything to turn black, like on a nature documentary when a deer gets caught by a tiger or something. They just sort of go limp as they're thinking, well, I guess this is it. Seconds later, the guy with the gun said, turn off the engine. Then when I did, he followed up with, get out of the car. I did as he said, feeling my knees wobble a little as I stepped onto the dirt outside. I didn't think I could get any more scared. But I was wrong, because when another guy spoke next, I felt like I honestly could have made an actual mess in my shorts. It's a cop, man. Just shoot him and let's get out of here. That suddenly roused me from being all frozen and silent in fear. I just started saying, I'm not a cop, I swear to God. I'm just looking for my grandpa's place. It all came out in one long frenzied sentence, and I can't really write everything I said into this. I was stammering though and my voice was shaking. I was just a mess. The same guy who'd talked before piped up again. He's lying, man. Just kill him. We can't lose this shipment. And that was the only clue I had as to what was going down in that meeting. I've agreed with a few other people's suggestions that it was drug related. I didn't know this at the time, but Douglas County, the county that Omaha is in, has a huge meth problem. Probably the biggest in the entire country. As myself and many others suspect, I probably stumbled across some sort of meth deal. Probably a pretty big one too, considering some of the hardware that was on display. Not only did I have some kind of gun in my face the whole time, but the other guys emerged with guns I'd only ever seen in Call of Duty. I'm talking the kinds with all sorts of attachments and stuff on them. Like I said, there was a hot minute there where I really did think I was about to die. Then, I heard a guy with a pistol trained on me say, Get the tape. I started to think that they might have something even worse in mind for me. What's weird, though, is that even though that didn't mean they were going to kill me, my survival instincts told me to at least buy a little more time. 
Thinking about it now, letting them tie me up like they did could have easily secured my death, not helped me avoid it. But still, I just let them do what they did in hopes that compliance might lead to mercy. They put tape over my eyes as well as around my wrists and ankles. They made me kneel in the dirt as they frisked me. I'm pretty sure they searched my car too. I mean it when I said they had some serious hardware, because I'm assuming you need something pretty advanced to make sure there's no secret recording equipment on a car. One of the guys said, car's clean, at one point. That made me realize these guys weren't just your average crackheads. I piped up again that I was not a cop, and that they could search me all they liked, but they wouldn't find a badge or a gun or anything like that. That didn't seem to satisfy them, though. They kept arguing amongst themselves about what to do with me. They took out my license at one point, because I could hear them passing it around and asking each other, You know this guy? You recognize him? Stuff like that. I can't even describe how relieved I was when I heard them all agree they'd never seen me before and that I probably really wasn't any kind of undercover cop or something. I was praying that meant they wouldn't kill me, but at the same time I knew I was still in quite a bit of trouble. Not long after that, they decided what they were going to do with me. The guy who'd been suggesting they kill me kept on making that suggestion. Then, the guy who'd ordered me tied up told them to shut the fuck up saying killing me was a bad idea. During these few moments of pure terror, he was like my best friend in the world. If it had been the bloodthirsty one in charge, I definitely wouldn't be around to write this. Then, right as it seemed I was going to get away unharmed, the boss of the group seemed to have a sudden change of heart. I started wailing about how I'd never snitch, how I'd just drive off and forget everything I saw. I'd cause them no trouble whatsoever, but that didn't seem to do the trick. When I heard the boss doing something with his gun, I begged him over and over not to kill me. I tried everything, reminding him it would be too much trouble, that I was sorry for interrupting them, that I didn't see anything, but not a word came out of my mouth that seemed to change his mind. I hadn't even finished talking when I felt him press the gun to the back of my head, and I felt myself starting to cry under the tape they'd wrapped around my eyes. I wished I'd never gotten out of bed that morning. The last thing I heard him say before he pulled the trigger was start digging a hole. Every muscle in my body seemed to tense up in preparation for oblivion. I heard the trigger pull with a dull click that seemed to echo around my skull. Then there was nothing though. No bang, no pain, no blood and brains. I wasn't falling forward or backward or wherever. I was still just kneeling there tensed up, feeling pee trickle down my thigh. They all started laughing at me, laughing at how I'd begged and pleaded with them not to kill me. It was just some cruel prank to instill the fear of God into me. Let me tell you, it worked. I felt the hot breath of the boss on the back of my neck. I'm keeping your license. If anything happens, I'm sending someone to pay you a visit. Think of it as an insurance policy. I was later told this was called dry firing, or something like that. After that, they tossed me in the back seat of a car, and from the very short distance I was moved, I figured I was back on my own. Not long after, I heard engines gunning, then moving vehicles, then silence. They left me there in the back of my car, tied up and blindfolded, for what felt like days. In reality, it was around 24 hours. If a passing farmer using the back roads hadn't spotted me, there's a real chance I might have died of dehydration. My phone had upwards of 50 missed calls. I had been reported missing by my parents. It was a whole ordeal, and obviously a big part of what followed was being questioned by police. I didn't ask to talk to them, but considering how I was found, it was a sure thing. I just stonewalled the deputy, who showed up and told my parents why I had refused to say a word about what happened. That was honestly the worst part. Having my own life threatened and being subjected to what amounted to a mock execution was one thing, but having my own mom and dad realize they were no longer safe in their own home was another thing entirely. We moved shortly after that, living with family in Des Moines for a few weeks. After, we could find an apartment, which my mom and dad then used as a base to sell their house. Every so often, the cruel maddening chaos of it all hits me at once, our entire lives were uprooted, all because of one wrong turn I made on a dirt road.
A few years back, I was out elk hunting with my brother up in Alberta, Canada. That morning, my hunting buddy Paul and I were headed out to hunt near the Simonette River. I only had my rifle with me, since Rob didn't have a big game license at the time. As some of you might know, that area is considered bear country, and since one half of a hunting party was very vulnerable without a firearm, we hit up the nearest ranger station and asked about any bear sightings. The ranger was very helpful, and warned us there was definitely a grizzly in the area. They had been tracking sightings for weeks though, and the ranger told us that if we stuck to certain trails and avoided others, we should be able to stay out of the bear's territory, which would lower our chances of encountering it greatly. That might seem silly to people who understand how vast a bear's territory can be, but up here, we believe that mitigation can be just as effective as outright protection. Anyway, we'd been walking for an hour or so. Because there was a fresh blanket of snow on the ground, it was much harder to recognize where each trail turned. At one point, we both realized we must have taken a wrong turn a mile or so back, because we could no longer recognize where we were. We decided to make our way back to the truck, so we could orient ourselves once again. That was when we suddenly noticed fresh wolf tracks in the snow. Wolves generally aren't as dangerous as bears. They're way too smart to attack humans. It still meant we got a little tense though, as we carried on padding through the snow in dead silence. Moments later, we caught a glimpse of an animal carcass laying there in the snow. It was barely touched, with no other scavengers nearby. This was a huge red flag to us, as crows tend to descend on anything that doesn't have an apex predator nearby. We both started to worry we were about to encounter something we really didn't want to. I loaded my rifle as we slowly approached, thinking we might be in for a close encounter with a wolf or a wolf pack who would be wanting to defend this carcass, obviously. As we both scanned the area, extremely on edge by that point, I heard this low calling sound. This huge tree seemed to be blocking my view of where it was coming from, so I couldn't see what was making it in that moment. That's when Paul suddenly let out a terrified high-pitched cry. It's a grizzly! Then, the next second, all I could see was a huge bear charging right at him. If you haven't seen how fast a bear can charge, it's hard to imagine how a lumbering beast can achieve such frightening speeds. I can assure you though, when they want to, those things can fly at you like a cannonball. It was truly terrifying to behold. The bear moved so fast I barely had time to react, and definitely not enough time to raise my rifle to aim. Still though, I had to get a shot off, even if just to scare it. I tried my best to aim from the hip and hit the bear in the head. I fired and nothing. The shot hit, but the bear didn't even so much as flinch. Luckily, Paul was able to take cover behind two trees that were pretty close together so they kind of acted like a palisade between him and the bear. The grizzly took a few swipes at him, missed, then kept moving around the tree before turning in my direction. I don't think I can even really describe the kind of terror I felt in that moment. It's like nothing I've felt before. Since we, I mean humanity, spend so much time dreaming up imaginary monsters for books or movies, when there are real-life monsters walking the earth alongside us, and here on this day, I found one charging straight at me. It must have been no more than 8 meters away from me when I reloaded my rifle's bullet and fired again. That time, I actually saw a spray of blood in the air from where the bullet tore through its shoulder, but to my horror, it didn't seem to flinch that time either. I had to fall back onto my butt and barely dodged a swipe it took at me. I just kept on crawling backward through the snow, I couldn't get the leverage to reload my rifle again. It took another swipe at me. I knew then that I must have put the bullet through an important part of its shoulder though, because the force surely wasn't as powerful as I thought it would be. I saw drops of blood splashing on the snow in front of me. It probably realized then that its arm was hurt, so that's when it opened its mouth to bite me, lunging forward as I lay there in the snow. I didn't really plan on it, but what I did next was pure instinct. I just grabbed my gun's barrel and shoved it towards its mouth to keep it from biting me. I watched the entire thing disappear down its throat. It actually bit down on it, and I swear I heard one of its teeth shatter as it chewed on the steel. For a few seconds, it pushed the rifle butt down into my neck. 
and that gave me the leverage I needed to actually work the bolt again to put another round in the chamber. Seconds later, I pulled the trigger again. It sent the bullet either through its brain or through its spine, because it just went limp and rolled onto its side in the snow. The whole event lasted no more than maybe 20 or 30 seconds, but it was the most terrified I'd ever been in my entire life. As scary as it had been though, the aftermath was probably worse. You'd think that after surviving something like that, you'd be all like, man, screw those bears. But I just felt a sickening regret. Grizzlies are beautiful animals, and if there were another way, I would have wanted it to live. I just didn't have that option though. In that moment, it was either it or me. There was no negotiating or communicating with it, and I think that's what scares me most about nature of all. Humanity's most powerful tool is our ability to communicate, but out there in nature, it's useless against other animals. If Mother Nature wants you dead, there's no stopping it. Either you die or it dies, and there's no in-between. Back in the 1950s, my grandpa used to sell vacuum cleaners door-to-door -door all over the country. He was one of the last great American traveling salesmen, the kind Arthur Miller wrote about, but with considerably less family trauma. He used to say how he'd had his fair share of close encounters with bad folks, as he called them, but he also had this one story that really stuck with me, for obvious reasons. So he's down in Florida, when he runs into a friend of his out on the road, a guy who sold steam irons. The guy told him that he'd just visited a place where the owner already owned a steam iron, but he was in the market for a vacuum cleaner. This was way back when Walmarts didn't exist yet, and getting a hold of items like that was way tougher than it is now. Plus, this guy was an old-timer who didn't get out all that much anyway. He gave my grandpa the hint. My grandpa thanked him, then headed out to look for the property. He was following the guy's directions to the letter. He'd even gotten a description of the guy's house too, so when he turned down some old dirt road and the house looked nothing like the one that was described, he figured he'd probably made a wrong turn. Lo and behold, when he went to check, the number was different on the mailbox. A completely different address, but given how he was already there, he figured he might as well try to sell something anyhow. As he was walking up to the guy's door, he saw a real-life alligator statue thing on the guy's front porch. As he got closer, he realized it had to be stuffed or something. It was super realistic. He got within about three feet of the guy's door. He'd had his eyes glued on this creepy realistic alligator when out of nowhere, the statue blinked. My grandpa said he froze. Then, right as he did, the gator turned its head and lunged toward him. He turned around and bolted back to his car. The whole way he could hear the gator chasing after him. When he got to his car door and turned around, it was right there trying to take a bite out of his ankles. He said he'd never been so scared in all his life. This guy had a freaking guard gator. Not a guard dog, a guard gator. My grandpa gunned his car engine and got out of there. He decided to skip the sales that day. A few years ago, I had this really erratic schedule where I had to get up super early for school before going to my part-time job until around 10 or 11 at night. I think there was about three months there where I didn't get any more than five hours of sleep a night. After a while, it started to have a really terrible effect on me. I found my memory started to become shot, my mood was seriously affected, and life in general just got really, really tough. I started making a lot of basic mistakes on a daily basis, and while some were just irritating, one almost cost me my life. It was when I was driving home one night, and although I made the same journey a hundred times before, my overtired brain was at a breaking point, and I made a wrong turn. I know what you're thinking, that's just a minor inconvenience. I could have just turned around and corrected my course immediately, but this wrong turn was down a one-way street and as fate would have it, some motocross mounted joyrider was coming the other way, doing 40 to 50 miles per hour. There wasn't a thing I could do about it. This kid had no helmet on either, so the second he impacted me, 
his head smashed right through his windshield, his body stopping only as his shoulders hit the crunched up glass. It was the most horrific sight I've ever seen in my entire life. The kid's head had completely split open, splashing blood all over me. There was no way he could possibly be alive. At least, that's what I thought at first. Then, as my screams died down, I could hear him groaning, with all these gurgles coming from where blood or something was caught in his throat. I heard those sounds in my nightmares for months afterwards. The kid died on his way to the hospital, unfortunately. I thought I was going to go to prison over it. I mean, I honestly believe I deserved to go to jail for a long time. It took a lot for people to talk me down and tell me that the kid was ripping it down the street on a stolen bike wearing no helmet going the wrong way, and if he hadn't made that choice, he'd still be alive. I made one dumb mistake, but the kid had made a fatal criminal one. I can't really justify that to myself, though. Even though the state didn't try to prosecute me, his mom tried to make a civil suit to get some money off me. I tried to offer her enough to cover the kid's funeral, but she wanted more. She wanted to see me in court. The whole civil suit thing was thrown out because of the whole Grand Theft Auto thing, though. I understand where she was coming from. She didn't want it to be nice and respectful or like charity. She wanted to take something from me because I'd taken something from her. I still go to therapy over the whole thing, and sometimes I see that kid's face in my dreams. The way his eyes were bulging out of his head with his head split open, somehow still alive groaning and gurgling his final breaths away, all because I went down the wrong street 